So we started uh, a while ago asking the question, what is entropy, and then what is entropy really? We made a lot of progress. I just wanted to fairly briefly discuss the implications of the second law for mechanical engineering. I want to explain this sentence, at least <laughs> to some extent, that the maximum efficiency of a heat engine is 1 minus Tc over Th, and it turns out that this is an implication of the second law. So first let me explain what is a heat engine. A heat engine is a machine that turns heat into work. Think about a steam engine. Steam is hot, and if you think about a steam engine, you have a fuel that's burned that turns water into steam, and then that steam, the expanding steam, pushes a piston and that with some force and the piston moves some distance and force times distance is work and then we know that there are various mechanisms of if you think about a steam locomotive, a railroad locomotive, the movement of the piston gets mechanically translated into the movement of the wheels which causes the train to move. Uh, think about a, an internal combustion engine like what you have in uh, a gasoline powered automobile. When the gasoline is exploded in the s cylinder it's extremely hot. The hot gases expand, they push a piston, and again you have uh, force times distance, the piston is moving, so the piston does work and that gets translated into the movement of the car. So in both a steam engine and a gasoline engine you have heat being turned into work. Think about a nuclear reactor. Well a nuclear reactor is just a big steam engine where instead of using wood or coal to turn the water into steam, you use the nuclear power to turn the water in, into steam. But it's still a heat engine and it's still turning heat into work. Now it's natural to think of heat and work as two completely different things. Work is some kind of organized movement and heat seems to be quite disorganized. We feel heat flows when we sense temperature changes. So it's really uh, rather puzzling how work can be turned, uh, how heat can be turned into work. Uh, the, the mechanical equivalent of heat was a subject that was investigated in the 19th century by the, the British um, physicist Joule. And Joule showed that heat and work were two aspects of the same thing in the following sort of but by using the following sort of experiment, he had a container of water and a propeller in the water. And the shaft of the propeller was connected to a weight. And as you lowered the weight, so you have force, which is the gravitational force on the weight, times distance, which is the amount of distance that the weight travels. And as the weight goes down, the propeller turns. And then he also had a thermometer in the water, so he could measure the temperature of the water. And what he found is that there's a direct relationship between how far the weight fell and how much the temperature of the water increased. So the mechanical work that was being done on the weight by the gravitational field got translated into heat in the water. And so this was the this famous experiment by Joule which showed that heat and work were two aspects of the same thing. So a heat engine turns heat into work. Now, to have a heat engine, you have to have a cold area as well as a hot area. 
It can't just have a hot area. Um, for, that is for a heat engine working in a cycle. If you put a steam engine in an environment that's above the boiling, whose temperature is above the boiling point of water, the steam engine can't work anymore because the steam can't recondense back into water to start a cycle. Um, if you put an internal combustion engine that runs on gasoline in an environment that's above the flash point of gasoline, then all the gasoline uh, goes up, uh, explodes all at once, and then the engine stops. So you need a cold region as well as a hot region in order to get a heat engine to work in a cycle. The TC is the temperature of the cold region, and the TH is the temperature of the hot region. So in an internal combustion engine, the hot TH is the temperature of the exploding gasoline, and TC is the ambient air temperature around the engine. And it turns out one can show, using the second law of thermodynamics, that the maximum efficiency of a heat engine is 1 minus TC over TH. Now, no, TC is less than TH, and so TC divided by TH is less than 1. So, so 1 minus TC over TH is less than 1. The only way to make it equal to 1, so 1 is the equivalent to 100% efficiency. The only way to make this equal to 1 is if TC were 0 which means if the cold, call it in mechanical engineering, the cold reservoir, if the cold reservoir is at absolute zero, then TC is zero, and then one minus TC over TH can be equal to one, which is 100% efficiency. Now, this perhaps has, in some sense, less importance than first meets the eye. It seems like this is saying that the second law puts a fundamental limitation on human technology. Well, yes it does. And in the real world, TC is never going to get a lot colder than, uh, let's say, 300 Kelvin or 250 Kelvin. Um, so, and there's a limit to how high TH can get. And so the maximum efficiency of, let's say, a coal-fired power plant, um, even if it were perfect, but given the temperatures that the ambient temperatures and the temperatures obtained by the steam, it's um, I, I don't recall the actual number. I think it's around the theoretical efficiency is around 50 percent. So around around half of the heat is not going to get turned into work. It's going to get wasted. But th this result only pertains to heat engines, and not all engines are heat engines. For example, electric motors are not heat engines, but they're pretty important. Uh, they, they're they a way of propelling certainly an automobile or, uh, or a train, um, but they're not heat engines, and so they don't have this kind of second law limitation. If you think about the biochemical processes that result in the motion of of our limbs, our legs, and our arms. Um, those are biochemical processes which also are not heat engines. It's another kind of chemical mechanism. So it's true that the second law puts a limit on how, excuse me, how efficient heat engines can ever get, but it doesn't put a limit on how efficient other kinds of engines can get. So that's why I say perhaps it's less important than uh, first appears. Now, let's get back to the general question we started with. In, in what sense is the intuition that the book uses, that entropy is randomness or uselessness, and that therefore the second law means that as time goes on, systems like the Earth are running down, to what extent is that a correct interpretation of the science? Well, it's quite problematic. So what I've done here is to discuss different intuitions for increasing entropy in order of more plausible or more correct to less plausible or less correct. So the first one is literally that systems go from low entropy to high entropy. And they do, as long as they're isolated systems. The second law says that, that they do that. Now the Earth, for example, is not an isolated system. It gets a very important energy flow from the sun. 
So you couldn't just look at the Earth in isolation and say it's going to high entropy. You have to include the Sun together with the Earth in order to do that. So the first one, the first one's fine. How about the second one here? The second one says that nature goes from less probable to more probable states. This should strike you as being surprising because we haven't talked about probability before and it, it indeed it is surprising and I don't think this is a useful way of thinking about entropy. If you are a junior or senior level physics major and you're taking a course in thermodynamics you'll be introduced to another way of looking at entropy which is the theory of statistical mechanics which was begun by Ludwig Boltzmann in the late 1900s. This is a way of trying to come up with a microscopic explanation of why does copper have this, ki this entropy in the lab and iron has that entropy in the lab. In other words, we discussed before a phenomenological way that you can measure entropy but that wasn't, they didn't explain why copper has a certain entropy, steel has a different entropy, oxygen has a different entropy, and water has a different entropy. Um, Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, working in the late 19th century, said, well, okay, thermodynamics is all correct and everything, but can we understand why different substances have different kinds of entropy, different amounts of entropy? And so he came up with a as I said, a microscopic theory called statistical mechanics. And if you're studying statistical mechanics, it can be useful to think of the mathematical calculations that you're doing as being similar to probability. I actually don't think it is literally probability. It's actually combinatorics, which is the science of counting. But com combinatorics is used an awfully lot in probability theory, and so non-mathematicians can blur the line between combinatorics and probability. Uh, Josiah Willard Gibbs, the uh, I think I can say that the most famous American economy, uh, American scientist of the 19th century, a very very uh, important uh, chemist. Um, was more cautious than Boltzmann about talking about these this microscopic explanation as being about entropy and Gibbs called called it an entropy analog. In other words, it's something kind of like entropy, but it's not literally entropy. So Gibbs was more careful in using language. Um, my bottom line is that uh, unless you're studying statistical mechanics and want some help with trying to get some intuition for why the equations work the way they do, it's not useful to think of entropy as having anything to do with probability. And then number three, more ordered to less ordered. Um, so that harkens back here to ordered and not random. Um, well, yes, if you think about a raw egg splattering, um, you know if somebody shows you a video and then shows you the video backwards, you know which way time goes. Uh, splattered eggs never spontaneously recombine, and so that shows the direction of time, and we saw before that the second law of thermodynamics was the only physical law that told you what time dimension was, and so maybe there's some intuition there for why going from more order to less order is increasing entropy, so maybe the raw egg splattering is an, an example of increasing entropy. Now a deck of cards, when it's new, it's nicely ordered, but then as time goes on and you start playing with the cards, they, they get shuffled and, and go out of order. If we look at the ordering of books in a library, the first day the library is open, all the books are in really nice call number order because the librarians put them that way, but then as people use the books and they get shelled and sometimes erroneously shelled, they get out of order. So these are all, the, all examples which lead people to think that the natural 
direction of time is from more order to less ordered, and since entropy also goes from less goes from less entropy to more entropy, then maybe entropy and order mean the same thing. Well, I, I think it's sufficient just to give one counterexample. Uh, think about oil and water. Suppose you have a salad dressing made of oil and water. You shake it, you mix it up, then you set it on a counter. As time goes on, the spontaneous direction is for the oil to separate from the water. So the system starts out being all mixed up, and then as time goes on, it becomes more ordered. So some physical systems, as time goes on, they become more ordered in some kind of intuitive sense, not, not less ordered, not, not more mixed up. Um, so yes, uh, water and ink go from more ordered, water with just one drop of ink when you first put the ink in, to less ordered when the ink gets all jumbled up with the water. But water and oil go the opposite way. And so entropy is going up in both directions, but I don't think it's correct to say that there's an intuitive connection between entropy and order because you have counterexamples like oil and water where the direction of increasing entropy is the direction of increasing order if we're using order in this kind of intuitive sense, which is what number three is all about. It's all about order in an intuitive sense, not order in a scientific sense. So w while your book interprets entropy as uh, increasing entropy as being related to more disorder, I, I, don't, I don't think that's correct. Um, more valuable to less valuable. Even Georgescu, who thought Bols uh, who um, was influenced by Boltzmann's interpretation of statistical mechanics, even Georgescu rejected sort of an entropy theory of value, that more valuable things were low entropy things. Uh, the counterexample he used is uh, mushrooms. And in the kind of vague sense of, of number three, Mushrooms are highly ordered, uh, b but you have some poisonous mushrooms. And poisonous mushrooms, uh, well, of course, uh, have, have a negative value. So if you want to use a vague notion of what entropy is, and I don't recommend it, then you do have a counterexample. Um, if you want to use a rigorous definition, then there are also counterexamples. Steel comes from iron by adding impurities to the iron. So that would be increasing the entropy in the iron, but also increasing its value. So in a rigor, even if you use a, both if you use a va the vague notion of what entropy is, and if you use a scientifically rigorous notion of what entropy is, the notion that uh, the second law of thermodynamics says that you're going from more valuable to less valuable things doesn't hold up. And finally, number five here, more informative to less informative. Now, this should strike you as being even more bizarre than the other things we've talked about because we haven't talked about information. Um, Claude Shannon, in uh, I think around the 1940s, came up with something called information theory. And information theory has nothing to do with physical entropy, nothing at all. It has to do with questions like, Suppose you want to design a new kind of Morse code for the language of, say, English. And you're limited in how many symbols you can transmit in an hour. And you're trying to design the Morse code so that you can transmit m the most possible meaningful English words. Then, for example, a letter that appears very often in English, the letter E, you'd want it to be represented by uh, a very short sequence of Morse code. Whereas a letter that gets represented in English very rarely, like the letter Z, well, you could use five or six dots and dashes for Zs. Uh, so whenever, whenever a Z came up, you'd have to use a lot of symbols, a lot of time, to transmit the letter Z, but the letter Z doesn't come up very often, and so that would be okay. 
Well, it turns out that when you're trying to ask questions like that, uh, how many English word, typical English words can be transmitted by a certain kind of Morse code versus a different kind of Morse code. You get an equation which is which has a mathematical form of the fundamental equation that Boltzmann came up with in statistical mechanics. It doesn't have anything to do with entropy or statistical mechanics or physics, but the form of the equation is the same. And Shannon decided to call that equation in information theory entropy. This has resulted in a tremendous amount of confusion over decades. Uh, let me say there's nothing wrong with information theory. And in fact, uh, information theory is actually used in some advanced econometrics. So there's nothing wrong with information theory. But calling that particular equation in information theory entropy is something that was really unfortunate because many people have been fooled into thinking that that entropy has something to do with physics and it doesn't have anything at all to, to do with physics. Okay, we are almost done with chapter one, but not quite. Um, we have one more video in which I'm going to tie all these things up.